Jeremiah chapter number 11, and tonight we can continue our study in the Word of God in the book of Jeremiah. And as I've mentioned before, um, I, I enjoy the study, this study of Jeremiah. Um, but you know, sometimes we look at uh, certain books of the Bible and say, well, that's a hard book. Jeremiah seems to be a hard book. There's a difficult message in Jeremiah. But let me just remind us that even in the midst of a difficult message like Jeremiah, God will give us exactly what we need. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All of it. Amen. And it's profitable. All of it's profitable. Amen. For doctrine, for, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And uh, so tonight, again, I, my challenge to us is as we study Jeremiah 11, uh, not that we look back and, and uh, just learn about the Jews in Jeremiah's day, the, the people of Judah in Jeremiah's day, but that we apply the Word of God to our lives today. But we ask God to give us what we need. And remember, all these things that were written aforetime were for our learning. And uh, they're for our learning so that we, through comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And so this story, Jeremiah 11, it's for us. All of it's for us. And so as we look into God's Word tonight, just ask God in a special way to give you exactly what you need. Let's pray together. Lord, I do ask you... Uh, to fill me with your spirit as I preach your word. Lord, you know the needs in this room. Uh, Lord, as no one else does. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll use your word to meet the needs that are here. Lord, may our hearts be open and receptive to you. Lord, may we be moldable. Lord, may you show us what we need tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah chapter 11. Remember last week we concluded Jeremiah 10, the, what's known as the Temple Sermon. Jeremiah chapter 7 through 10, Jeremiah had preached in the gate of the temple. And so as people were coming and going to worship, he was there at the gate of the temple preaching. And his message was not a popular message. As a matter of fact, we see uh, that in Jeremiah 7, he addressed the fact that the people were trusting in the fact that they had the temple and they said, listen, we have the temple. We're spiritual because we go to the temple. We worship at the temple. And the Lord said, listen, he said, I want your obedience, not your sacrifice. And then we saw in the very next chapter, Jeremiah chapter 8, still the same sermon, the same, same message. The people were basically boasting in the fact that they had the law of God. They had the word of God. And what did the Lord say in Jeremiah chapter 8? He said, I've made the pen of the scribes in vain. He said, it's not spiritual just because you have a Bible, so to speak, or because you know it or read it. The question is, what do you do with it? What are you, what are you living on what you've read? And uh, then in Jeremiah chapter 9, the people were, uh, were depending on one of their outward rituals, circumcision. And the Lord said, he said, I'm going to judge you, the circumcised, with the uncircumcised. Because he said, I'm not looking for an outward, outward pretense of spirituality. I want your hearts to be right. And then we saw uh, last week, Jeremiah chapter 10, uh, the very end of the message in Jeremiah 10, verse 2, the Lord said, learn not the way of the heathen. He said, don't learn the way of the heathen. Don't become like the world. And uh, then we saw uh, at the end of Jeremiah 10, verse 21, he said, the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper. What does it mean to seek the Lord? It literally means to seek His face, to see if He is pleased. The question in life should not be, am I pleased? The question should not be, is a fellow brother and sister in Christ pleased? The question is, is God pleased? Uh, we don't want to settle. We don't want to settle for a second-rate Christianity. And a second-rate Christianity is men try to impress other men. That's second-rate Christianity. What we want instead is we want a sincere heart with the Lord. We want to seek the Lord, seek His Word, and do that which is pleasing to the Lord. And then verse 23, Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Verse 24, Jeremiah prayed as we should pray, O Lord, correct me. Correct me. It takes wisdom to ask God to correct you because that's what we need. We need, we need correction. Uh, it's, it's proud, it's pride and arrogant to think, boy, I've arrived. I don't need any correction. Uh, that's what the problem was with the church in Laodicea. They were lukewarm and their estimation of themselves was what? We have need of nothing. 
Well, hey, what, what do you what do you really need God to do in your heart? Oh, not much anything. I'm pretty good. I mean, I'm, I'm where I need to be. Jesus said, but knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. See, God's estimation of us can be totally different than our own estimation. Uh, we think we know our hearts, but God says uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his works. And so, again, Jeremiah prayed with wisdom, O oh Lord, correct me. Now, here in Jeremiah chapter 11, we see once again the word of the Lord coming to Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Again, make no mistake, this is God's word. This is not Jeremiah's word. This isn't Jeremiah making these, uh, these sermons up. This is God's word. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace. You're going to notice several times in the Bible where God said, I brought you out of the iron furnace. What is he talking about? Other places, he talks about the furnace of affliction. God allowed the children of Israel to go through extreme uh, pressure, extreme heat, extreme difficulty uh, when they were slaves under Pharaoh's hand. And his goal was not just to cause them pain. There was a purpose in the pain. There was a purpose in the pressure. There was a purpose in that iron furnace. And the purpose was that they would come forth and be a peculiar treasure unto him. Listen, when God allows you to go through a tough time, can I say it like this? Don't waste that tough time. Right. And what I mean by that is this. God, God has a desire and a goal for you, and He wants to melt you and mold you and make you into exactly what He has in mind. Don't, don't waste that difficulty. That's good, Let God do a work in you. And He said to the children of Israel, He said, I brought you out of the iron furnace. Now the problem was they had wasted all that work God had invested in them because they had turned against the Lord. So notice again verse 4, he says, uh, verse 3, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and do them according to all which I command you, so shall ye be my people, and I will be your God, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. Then answered I and said, So be it, O Lord. Jeremiah said, Lord, you've, you said this. You said a curse would come if we departed from you. You said blessing would come if we obeyed you. So be it, O Lord. Uh, let's look at a few passages. What covenant is he talking about? Look here in Exodus, first of all. Look at Exodus 19. He said, This is the covenant that I made with you in the day that you came out of Egypt. Remember, the children of Israel had been slaves in Egypt, and God brought them out with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm. He brought them out, they spoiled the Egyptians, and He made a covenant with them. And I want you to see now uh, Exodus 19, and we, we can see this in several places uh, in the Bible uh, in regards to this covenant. Look at Exodus 19, verse 5. He says, Now therefore, if, that's a big if, if, Ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant. Then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. He said, listen, I brought you out of that fiery furnace, the furnace of iron. I brought you from the, smelter, from the smelting pot and uh, the melting pot. He said, I brought you out in order to mold you and make you into a peculiar treasure unto me, above all people. Now what's the key? He said, if you'll obey my voice, if you'll keep my covenant, then you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me. Go to Deuteronomy, please. Deuteronomy. Again, the first five books known as the books of the law of Moses and that God used Moses to pen these down. And here in Deuteronomy, uh, he is basically giving the children of Israel last instructions before he heads... Uh, he heads to be with the Lord. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. 
verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee. Why does God lead us through a wilderness sometimes? To humble us. Why does He lead us through a wilderness where He allows us to hunger? Didn't He say He would take care of their needs? He did take care of their needs. Maybe not in the way they expected Him to, but He took care of their needs. And so, why does God lead the way He does? To humble us. Notice next. Uh, to prove us. Verse 2. And to know what was in thine heart. You know, sometimes we need to be shown what's in our hearts. Right. Some, sometimes we, we need to realize what's there. Right. And He said to know what was in thine heart and whether thou wouldest keep His commandments or no. Verse 3. And He humbled thee. And suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know, that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. He said, listen, I've called you, and I want you to keep my commandments. Look down in verse 18. He says, but thou shalt remember... The Lord thy God, for it is He that giveth thee power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant which He sware unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. You remember when Jeremiah preached and he said, you need to hearken to what they say. We will not hearken. He said, you need to ask for the old paths. You need to walk therein. They said, we won't do it. We won't do it. We're, we're not going to obey. Uh, continue on now. Look at Deuteronomy 27. So again, what's this covenant when God said, Jeremiah, go preach, go listen, hear the covenant, and then go speak this covenant to all the men of Judah. I mean, just go throughout Jerusalem, go throughout Judah and preach to people, preach to them about the covenant and about the fact that they've broken this covenant. Look at Deuteronomy 27, verse 11. What you have here in Deuteronomy 27, you have a mountain of blessing and a mountain of cursing. Basically what you have here is an outdoor natural amphitheater. You have two mountains on either side. You've got a big valley in between. And you have one group of people standing on one mountain called the Mount of Blessing. And another group of people standing on a mountain called the Mount of Cursing. You have Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing. And Mount Evil, the Mount of Cursing. And this was a, a, just a large place where the people could all hear what was being said. Now I want you to see uh, what he says here. Deuteronomy 27, 11. So this is... This is like almost like a State of the Union address. He's uh, addressing the nation. Notice what he says, Deuteronomy 27, 11. And Moses charged the people the same day, saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you come over Jordan. Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. He said, You're going to be on Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing. Verse 13. And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, and Asher, and Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak. The Levites, the spiritual leaders, shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. If you continue reading on there, he lists some more cursing. And if you look down in verse 26, he says, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of the law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Now go to chapter 28, verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if 
Thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And then he starts to read a bunch of blessings. He says, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. And he reads blessing after blessing. And what's, what is the criteria? The criteria is if, if you observe to do the Lord's commandments. Right, right. Now look at verse 13. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the commandment of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And then he begins to list a number of curses if they won't listen to the word of God. Now go down to verse 62, Deuteronomy 28. Verse 62. And ye shall be left, this is the end of these curses, just a great number of curses if they don't listen to God. And ye shall be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people. That's exactly what happened. Why? Because they didn't listen to the Word of God. They, they got tired of the preachers telling them what the Word of God said. They wanted to have it their way. Like Burger King. Folks, that's not a good way to live your life spiritually. Let God have His way. Verse 64. The Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known even wood and stone. What did he say to them? He said, listen, if you'll keep my commandment, I'll bless you. But if you won't listen, I'll curse you. If you won't listen, you'll be cast out of this good land. Look back in Jeremiah 11. This is the message Jeremiah is preaching. It's not a popular message. Why? Because the people haven't kept God's word. They haven't hearkened to God. And they are being told by false prophets and false preachers that they're going to have peace. Peace where there is no peace. And Jeremiah is preaching what seems to be a negative message, but it's a true message. And he's telling them, listen, the day is coming. There's a king coming from the north who's going to take everything from you. He's going to destroy you, and only a remnant's going to be left. Now look in Jeremiah 11 again. Verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant. And that's all those things we just read about. And speak unto the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you. So shall you be my people and I will be your God that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day then answered I and said so be it O Lord then the Lord said unto me verse 6 proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem saying hear ye the words of this covenant and do them for I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. You know, God protests with us. He reasons with us. He uh, says, Let's come, let us reason together. Uh, when we want to walk off uh, in our own path away from the Word of God, He reasons with us and He protests and He does whatever He can to get our attention. But the children of Judah, God didn't have their attention. Verse 7 again, or verse 8, yet they obeyed not, even though he protested to them for such a long period of time, yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked everyone in the imagination of their evil heart. They didn't want it God's way, they wanted it their way. Therefore, he said, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but 
They did them not. Now look at verses 9 through 11. The Lord said there's a conspiracy of disobedience. What's a conspiracy of disobedience? It means people got together and decided together to be disobedient. Yeah. You know, you have to watch out who your friends are. Yeah. You have to make sure you have the right kind of friends. Uh, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Uh, uh oh, he that walketh with wise men, what does the Bible say? Shall be wise. But a companion of fools will be destroyed. Uh, you, you, and I know this isn't scripture, but it's absolutely true. You are now or soon shall be what your friends are. You do become like your friends. Now that you spend enough time around people, you'll get to be like them in one way or another. And this is why it's so important to have good, godly friendships. And here, these people had a conspiracy to disobey God. You know, you can, you can be bold even in disobedience when you have a friend disobeying with you. Right. I mean, it's an amazing thing. What, what kind of wickedness people can get into when they have a partner or two or three. Be careful. Right. And on the other hand, it's an amazing thing. What kind of good you can accomplish for God when you have a good godly friend or two or three. Amen. So notice here, verse 9, the Lord said unto me, a conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Mm -hmm. Folks, how many times had God pled with them and begged them and wanted them to cry out to Him? Right. But there does come a point of no return. Right. There does come a point where God has said His last. Where God has extended His offer just for so long. Notice verse 12. The Lord said that He would not hear. Even if Jeremiah prayed for these people. Look at verse 12. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods unto whom they offer incense. But they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. For according to the number of thy cities were thy gods, O Judah. And according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem have ye set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal. Therefore pray not thou for this people. Neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. God wouldn't hear Jeremiah. He wouldn't hear these people. Why? Because they had continually rebelled against God. And then he, he again likens their sin to spiritual adultery. They've been committing a, a spiritual adultery by putting up these idols in the very temple of God Himself. And look at verse 15. He says, What hath my beloved to do in mine house, seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many. And the holy flesh is passed from thee. When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. Do you notice the term God used? He said, my beloved. These were to be special people to God. These were This city was to be a special place to God. Look at 2 Chronicles, please. Keep your finger here. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter number 6. 2 Chronicles chapter number 6. And look at verse number 5. 2 Chronicles 6, verse 5, Solomon had built a temple unto the Lord. And uh, look at verse, uh, in fact, back up just to verse 4, the Bible says, and he said, 2 Chronicles 6, 4, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who hath with his hands fulfilled that which he spake with his mouth to my father David, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt. I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build a house in that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be a ruler over my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. If you go back to Jeremiah 11, he says, what hath my beloved to do? He said, he said I chose you. I gave you every advantage. Why did you turn away from me? Here in verse 16, verses 16 and 17, you see him likening the children of Israel to an olive tree. If you look in uh, chapter 11, verse, or, or in Romans rather, chapter 11, you hear God talking about Israel like that olive tree. But let's read here, verse 16. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he hath kindled 
fire upon it. And the branches of it are broken. For the Lord of hosts that planted thee hath pronounced evil against thee. The Lord planted them. Remember, they were to be a peculiar treasure. They were to be, they were to have a special relationship. They were like an olive tree that God Himself had planted. And now God Himself is uprooting it, and God Himself is burning it down, and God Himself is tearing it down. Verse 17: The Lord of hosts that planted thee hath pronounced evil against thee for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves. Sin is always against yourself. Yes, you sin against God, but it always harms you. Uh, sin, sin. Uh, a lot of times, when we sin, we don't sin for the devil. You know, so I'm going to sin for the devil. No, when people sin, they sin because they think it will make them happy. But notice, sin is always against yourself as well. Notice he said, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense unto Baal. Now I want you to notice verse 18. Jeremiah is preaching. And there's a group of men now that really don't like what Jeremiah is saying. There's a whole lot of people that don't like what Jeremiah is saying. But specifically, there's a group that we're going to see in this chapter mentioned. And I want you to keep your finger here. Go back to Jeremiah 1. And we're almost done tonight. Well, I say that. I think it'll be a little while here. Still. About 10 more minutes. You know, like Paul, finally, brethren, that kind of thing. Finally again and again. But look at Jeremiah chapter 1. I want to remind us of some things we studied at the very beginning of this book. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin. Uh, he, where is he at? He's in the land of Benjamin, in Anathoth, among priests. These are supposed to be spiritual leaders. Now remember what God had said. He said, Jeremiah, when you preach, you're going to preach to princes, you're going to preach to priests. You're going to preach to the people. He gave a whole list of people, including his own family, that he would be preaching against. And I want you to see how God prepared him again. Let's remember this. You look at Jeremiah chapter 1, and at verse 14, Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. This is speaking of the Babylonian captivity. Verse 15, For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come, and they shall set everyone his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls that are around about, and against all the cities of Judah, and I will utter my judgments. This is God's word, Jeremiah's preaching. I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and worshiped the works of their own hands. Thou therefore gird up thy loins. Anytime you see somebody girding up their loins in the Bible, they were usually either fighting or fleeing. God said, Jeremiah, you're going to need to do a little bit of both. He said, you're going to be on offense sometimes. You're going to be on defense sometimes. You're going to preach and your own family isn't going to like what you have to say. You're going to preach and the men of Anathoth are going to try to kill you. Now, I've, I've had family get upset with me before. I don't think I've had any of them try to kill me yet. Thank God for that. <laughs> but Jeremiah is facing the very literal possibility that his family wants to kill him for the stand he's taking. Literally kill him. Continue reading. Verse 17. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests, there's some family thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. And we've heard it said, God plus one makes a majority. No, God alone is a majority. Amen. Make sure you're on His side. Make sure you're doing His will. Was Jeremiah doing God's will when he was going throughout Judah and Jerusalem and preaching this message? He was absolutely doing God's will. Amen. And God let him in on a little bit of insight. Look at Jeremiah 11 again, verse 18. He let him know that the men of Anathoth were trying to kill him. 
He let him know that his hometown, family no doubt in the midst, were trying to kill him because of the message that he was preaching. Verse 18, And the Lord hath given me knowledge of it, and I know it, uh, and I know it, then thou showest me their doings. But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter. Who does that remind you of? Jesus Christ. The Bible says about Jesus, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Jeremiah came unto his own. He was doing the will of God. But even his own didn't want to hear what he had to say. And he said, I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter. And I knew not that they had devised devices against me saying, let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof and let us cut him off. He's talking about our land being like that olive tree being destroyed. We're going to make him that olive tree. We're going to cut him down and kill him and burn him. Notice, let us destroy the tree of the fruit thereof. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. What they forgot was he wasn't coming in his name. He was coming in God's name. He was bearing the word of God. Verse 20, But O Lord of hosts, that judgest righteously, that triest the reins in the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. Now I want you to see some very important words here. He said, let me see thy vengeance. Right. Right. He didn't say, God, let me get vengeance on them. Right. He didn't say, Lord, give me my vengeance. Right. Right. That's not what he said. Right. He said, let me see thy Thank vengeance you. on them. For unto thee have I revealed my cause. I didn't go around trying to build an army, uh, trying to rally the troops and get people on my side. I revealed my cause to you, Lord. I'm in your hand, God. Do with me what you will. Lord, you know the truth. Please help me. You know, the safest place in the world is where? It's in the center of God's will. Notice Romans 12 with me, please. Let's turn there. Romans chapter 12. This is, can be hard stuff to swallow, but it's sweet. It's good stuff. Hey, man. Romans 12, verse 17. It's true. Hey, man. Recompense to no man, evil for evil. Romans 12, 17. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you. In other words, make every effort. Live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Did you know God can do a much better job with those who are attacking you than you can? God knows so much better the ins and outs and his ways are he's so much wiser, he knows how to how to take care of things. He just does. You know, I think about David running for his life from Saul. Uh, David, if Saul had had a half a head on his shoulders, he would have realized David was one of the best friends he had. Because David was a, a sincere servant of God, he was a sincere servant of the king. But Saul was trying to kill him because he envied him. And what did David do over and over and over again? He said, I'm not going to lay my hand on the Lord's anointed. He said, I'm in God's hand. Lord, do in so many words and many times he said, Lord, do with me what you want to do with me. Look at verse 20. Therefore, because vengeance is the Lord's, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Be careful that you don't become like the person you're criticizing. Be careful that you, you don't use the same weapons they do. Are you any better? Who's worse, the critic or the critic of the critic? Who's worse? See, the fact is, we're not to be overcome of evil. We're to overcome evil with good. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Look at 2 Chronicles 16, please. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 22. 
Second Chronicles 16, verse... I wrote down the wrong one. No, First Chronicles. That, that's, I'm reading it wrong now. My wife wrote those books. Right? <laughs> it's her fault. First Chronicles 16, look at verse 22. Notice what the Lord said. Again, Jeremiah has a very difficult job. What does God say? He said, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Now, folks, if you read, you'll read that again in Psalm 105, verse 15. Turn now to Matthew 23. Where's the safest place in the world? It's in the center of the will of God. I have a question. Were there times that the prophets faced harm? Yes, there were. Even doing the will of God. Look at Matthew 23. Verse 29, Jesus said it this way. He said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The Lord said, Jeremiah, you have a job to do. Folks, as long as you're in the center of the will of God, you're invincible till it's time for God to call you home. These people that uh, were doing the will of God and lost their lives, was that an accident or did God know, was God with them every step of the way? He was with them every step of the way. The safest place in the world is the center of the will of God. And Jeremiah prayed when he found out what the men of Anathoth were doing. Let's go back and we'll finish. Jeremiah 11. When he prayed, he said, O Lord of hosts, that judgest righteously, that triest the reins in the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. But, but what if it doesn't work out the way I think it should? Leave it in God's hands. Right. Leave it in God's hands. His way is always best. Amen. Don't expect to always understand it. Amen. Don't expect that. Trust His heart, though. Trust His heart. Thou, O Lord of hosts, that judgest righteously, that triest the reins in the heart, let me see Thy vengeance on them, for unto Thee have I revealed my cause. And in this case, God said, I am going to deal with these men of Anathoth. Verse 21, Therefore thus saith the Lord of the men of Anathoth, that seek Thy life, saying, Prophesy not in the name of the Lord, that Thou die not by our hand. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters shall die by famine. And there shall be no remnant of them. There will be a remnant of other people, but not of the men of Anathoth. For I will bring evil upon the men of Anathoth, even the year of their visitation. What did Jeremiah learn to do? He learned just to rest in God's hand. We don't have time to look through all these verses, but I want to look at a few in the book of Psalms. And there are many more like this all throughout the Scripture. But I want to encourage you. Go to the Psalms. When you're facing a difficulty, you're facing a battle, you're facing maybe an enemy, you're facing somebody who would try to destroy you, leave them in God's hand and you realize you're in God's hand. Look what the psalmist said. Psalm 4, verse 8. He said, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep how can you sleep, David? People are trying to kill you. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For Thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Look at Psalm 34. 
Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 4. Again, I wish we had time to read all these verses. But look at verse 4. It says, I sought the Lord, and He heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto Him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. Look unto the Lord, and you won't be ashamed. Verse 6, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Look at verse 17. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Look at Psalm 59. Psalm 59, look at verse 1. Psalm 59, verse 1. Deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves without my fault. Awake to help me and behold. Look at Psalm 91. This entire chapter, I hope you'll read it later. We don't have time to read the whole thing. But look at the first few verses. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Verse 5, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Verse 8, Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Continue reading verse 14. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. And then look at Psalm 140. Again, this is just a few of many verses. Psalm 140, look at verse number 4. Psalm 140, verse 4. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man who have purposed to overthrow my buildings. What did Jesus say in John 10? And I know we use it for eternal security, and it's true for that. But it's also true for every other area of life. What did Jesus say? He said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And neither, now, I don't, now I'm going to mess it up. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You're in God's hand when you're saved. Look at John. I just want to read it just right. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Where are you at? You're in God's hand. Right. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Yeah. I and my Father are one. Hi everybody, this is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky, and I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior, and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect, and we are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. The Scripture says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20.14 and 15 says, In death and hell, or cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. 
It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life, heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.